One of the current greatest mysteries of the universe is one we didn't know existed until 2007. Known as fast radio bursts, these mysterious short-term bursts of radio energy are of completely unknown origin. While we know a bit about them, such as that their origin must be something very small in size, they display behavior that we don't understand at all, such as some of them repeat. Up until now, only one repeating FRB had been detected, but due to work being done with the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, a group of new FRBs have been discovered including another one that repeats. Today, my guest is a member of that team. Sriharsh Tendulkar is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Physics at McGill University and the McGill Space Institute specializing in FRBs and neutron stars. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Sriharsh, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, it's in the news today that the the um, that your experiment, the uh, the Chime experiment, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, detected more fast radio bursts. Could you tell us a little bit about your experiment? Sure. So, Chime is a new telescope which we have built in British Columbia. It consists of these. Um, four half cylinders. They look like snowboarding half pipes, which are 20 meters wide and 100 meters long. And Chime doesn't look at different parts of the sky like most telescopes you, you, you can imagine. So it doesn't point to specific locations in the sky. It just looks straight up. And as the sky rotates, it maps the entire sky in a day. So it looks at a huge swath of the sky at one at any given point of time. And that gives it an enormous amount of power to detect and characterize fast radio bursts. Now, this is a, it also looks at a lower frequency than, than what FRBs have been detected at before, but they're extremely broadband, or at least that's my understanding. So what, what is the, the low frequency aspect of this? What are you looking at at those frequencies, particularly in regards to fast radio bursts? Right. So there are two different aspects. One is that to understand the emission mechanisms of fast radio bursts better, we would like to detect them at different frequencies. So for example, a microwave does not, microwave oven does not emit ultraviolet light. A light bulb does not emit X-ray light. So each emission mechanism has a range of frequencies over which it can emit. So by trying to study fast radio bursts at different frequencies, we can constrain which emission mechanisms are actually uh, working for at, in these sources and so chime sits in a range uh, frequency range which had not been probed before and the other part is that at, as you go to lower frequencies there are many propagation effects which come into play and become stronger so for example when light travels through the intergalactic medium it under it undergoes so different kinds of processes there is absorption there is scattering and all these processes make it harder to detect fast radio bursts and they become more intense at lower frequencies. So by studying, so conversely, if you detect fast radio bursts at low frequencies, you can study these processes in much greater detail and you're able to separate out what characteristics of FRBs are internal and what characteristics come out from the propagation. So this is very important because few years down the line, we are hoping that we'll get a huge population of fast radio bursts. And we want to be able to use these as probes of the universe, probes of the electron density and the magnetic field distributions in the universe. Now, interestingly, this, this tells us both about absorption in the inter, intergalactic medium, 
but also it, it helps characterize what the origin of the fast radio bursts are. Um, what does it tell us? What does it tell us about the origin of them? Right. So at this point, it's still a the field is still in its very early st early uh, stages. So it's we are there are too many uh, different theories and we cannot put concrete constraints on them. There are a couple which don't expect emission at very low frequencies and those we can rule out because we have seen uh, emission from fast radio bursts at these low frequencies now. So there are some which we can rule out but mo most of the uh, FRBs there is still a lot there is still a lot more work to be done before we can rule in or rule out particular theories. Now, fast radio bursts are a relatively new phenomenon, only discovered, as I recall, in 2007 um, with the initial original Lorimer burst, I think it was called. Absolutely. Um, now, these, they, these certainly are extragalactic in nature, right? They, we have not observed any kind of uh, fast radio burst from the Milky Way itself, right? No, we have not observed anything like that from uh, the Milky Way or even the nearby galaxies. So, the, it is... Um, it is not to say this is not to say that there aren't any fast radio bursts from nearby galaxies. There are a couple of different caveats. One is that if the these uh, for a given galaxy, the fast radio the rate of fast radio bursts would be very rare. So you would have one fast radio burst in a given galaxy uh, very infrequently. So it's possible that we simply have not yet seen one. So maybe the source of fast radio bursts exists somewhere in our galaxy or nearby but we haven't seen it yet. And secondly, these things, if you, these fast radio bursts, if you bring them from their current distances, which are billions of light years away, into our own galaxy, they would be extremely bright to the point that our telescopes might just throw away those signals as noise. Oh, so we could actually be seeing them, but we can't recognize it's possible. them. It's possible. So we, uh, they might simply be out of the scope of what we are looking for. You know, you go try, you try to look for faint signals, and you're just saturated completely by the bright ones. That happens. So when you look at when you look out, you're looking at these very distant galaxies, and you're seeing fast radio bursts. And I've I've heard some estimates that there could these could be happening all the time, and we could there could be a thousand per day or something. We just don't know what we're, you know. We just don't see them. Yeah, that. So uh, the other part is that radio telescopes look at a fairly small fraction of the sky at any given point of time. So CHIME has the largest field of view of the telescopes which are searching for fast radio bursts. And it looks at around 200 to 250 square degrees in the sky. The sky, the whole sky is 42,000 square degrees approximately. So, you know, even CHIME is looking at only a fraction, but compared to other uh, telescopes, which look at a fraction of a square degree, CHIME is looking at a much larger area. Right, so CHIME follows the rotation of the Earth, right? So it yeah. looks at a sort of a line across the sky. It, uh, yeah, it looks at a band across the sky. Now, you had mentioned that we could maybe use these as probes of the universe. In what way? Could you expand on that? Sure. So as the radio wave propagates through the intergalactic medium, you're basically interacting with every electron and every magnetic field there is. So you get scattering, you get dispersion, you get a bunch of different effects. And we can use these to study the distribution of electrons and magnetic fields along the line of sight. So from each FRB to Earth, you can understand the effect of the total effect of the magnetic fields and electrons. Now imagine you have a lot of these fast radio bursts. You're basically probing, say, 10,000 line, different lines of sight through uh, the universe to and these will intersect different galaxies, galactic halos. Some of them will go through galactic clusters. And we can use all of this information together to do a sort of tomography, if you will, of the universe and to understand how the structures in the universe formed. So wherever there are electrons, there are protons. And so you can, you're tracing hydrogen gas and uh, basically matter in the universe. So FRBs would be a completely independent probe of this very diffuse gas which other probes cannot reach so this diffuse gas is too too low temperature to emit x-rays but and it is also too diffuse to be seen in optical or visible light so this thing can be probed only by fast radio bursts 
That's astonishing. So essentially, as you said, tomography of the universe, you is sort of yep. taking an x-ray of the universe. Sort of. We are taking a radio x-ray of the universe. A radio x-ray of the universe. <laughs> and I mean, imagine if you <laughs> got the possibilities, because if you're looking at like a galaxy, you know, with a fast radio burst, you could... That, that's that's absolutely amazing, mind-boggling. Yeah, now, I mean, so for a for a given galaxy, we won't, we might not have too many fast radio bursts going through them, through it, because there are a lot of galaxies in the entire sky, and if we collect, you know, ten thousand, fifty thousand FRBs, it's still not sufficient to have multiple FRBs through one galaxy. But statistically, you can make a make a better constraint on the structure of the universe. So you could you could essentially if you had a lot of sources of FRBs and they're as common as th as they're thought to be, you could do a map of sorts, couldn't you? You could, yeah. So people are thinking about already doing map, uh, doing improved cosmology through this. So uh, using FRB data sets and uh, cosmic microwave background data sets to break some degeneracies in their parameters and work better, get better constraints basically. So you could ultimately create maybe a 3D model of the universe with through this? So people are already trying to create 3D models of the universe. Uh, there are a lot of efforts from radio astronomers and optical astronomers, and there is a lot of data out there. FRBs add a new dimension. So every data set has uh, some number of dependent parameters, right? So some things are some things, some parameters vary together. They are covariant and you can't break the degeneracy. And if, if you have an independent probe, you can sometimes break these degeneracies and get independent measurements. So that is what FRBs bring to the table. It's a new independent probe. A new independent probe of the universe. Now, yes. what we really don't know about these is what the source could be. Um, mm -hmm. We hear about odd neutron stars like blitzars and things like that maybe being the the source or black holes, you know um, What what is your sense? What 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 do you suspect the origin of the FRBs is? So the best most theories uh, to date there and there are a lot of them They invoke neutron stars because you to create these brief but extremely bright bursts You need a very strong magnetic field and you need the source to be compact and neutron stars fulfill both of those criteria. Uh, and you can have different models. You can have a magnetic reconnection in a magnetar, which is a highly magnetized neutron star. And that sort of burst could create a fast radio burst. It could provide the energy to create a fast radio burst. Or you could have something like a merger of neutron stars. So that's another possible model. Uh, so you have two neutron stars, uh, which are uh, revolving around each other and eventually as their orbit decays, they merge, and that creates this massive explosion and a flash, possibly a flash of radio light. Now, um, there are a lot of other models as well, uh, and one of the things I should say that you know, while neutron stars are the most commonly thought of model, there are there could be other explanations. So there are people who invoke black uh, neutron stars uh, orbiting, you know the supermassive black holes at centers of galaxies that are quasar jets and so on and so forth which could possibly lead to such mechanisms such emissions as well so is it what about now black holes are are mentioned as a possible explanation in and of themselves maybe something going on in an accretion disk or something like that do you think there's any likelihood that um, like a supermassive black hole at a galactic center might be might be at fault and the reason i ask that is um i've read that the FRBs seem to, they seem to be in a, in a, in a very intense environment. Um, in addition to magnetic fields, there's also, you know, possibly gases and things like that involved, something dense. Um, what do you think about a black hole as a, as a source? Uh, so most, so most supermassive black holes are pretty large. So to get this millisecond time scale, you need something which is pretty small. You need something that is um, smaller than about 300 kilometers. So most supermassive black holes in of themselves are really large, right? And so you can't get these very short time scales from those supermassive black holes. But you can imagine that there are uh, conditions around these supermassive black holes which could lead to uh, very sh uh, sharp brief emissions. 
so that's certainly a possibility and people have put forth models uh, involving supermassive black holes now that so the the actual millisecond nature of these the very short duration at which at which they uh, tr emit uh, that constrains it to a very small object then yes so that really constrains it because it, at those energies what uh, what else is there other than neutron stars um, but uh, now the the other aspect of these is that there appears to be at least on its face different types of FRB in that one type and and you guys discovered the second example of it where it repeats so you have whatever it is it has to be able to repeat at least that class of frb opening up the possibility of multiple origins um what was the repeater like what how often did that repeat and was there any regularity to it or was it just randomly repeating right so uh it did not have any regularity to it it some there were times when the first repeater which we observed for the past uh, two years it uh, sometimes would burst show you know 30 bursts in a few days and then there would be times when for on for months on end there would be no bursts at all despite our uh, extremely sensitive observations so it showed some sort of uh, activity going up and down and there was no regularity we tried to tried hard to find some sort of periodicity in these bursts because whenever we have seen pulsars Pulsars usually we can see a very clear signal of a periodicity. So they are because intrinsically they are uh, formed because of the rotation. So it's like a lighthouse where the beam goes towards us and then it rotates again and then the beam shows up again. And we see period periodicity in pulsars from even five bursts. We can detect five bursts and say, okay, look, this is the period. For the for this repeating FRB, the first one. We have we tried to do this with hundreds of bursts, but not found. We have not found any periodicity. And the second uh, repeater which we have found, we are we are hoping to follow it up further as time goes on, and hopefully we'll understand more about its properties as well. Now, one of the reasons I asked is is we have this odd supernova. I think it's being referred to as a, the cow supernova, uh, where it's mm -hmm. it's sort of sputtering, um, and maybe that you know a supernova might be a possible explanation for um for frbs or, or the repeaters anyway um can you think of any mechanism in a supernova that might might create that effect uh not really in the sense it again boils down to the time scale time scale question because supernova supernovae are large so the star itself is huge firstly and then when a supernova explodes the size of this ejecta is incredibly large and the time scales at which supernovae vary are are really long compared to the time scales of fast radio bursts so supernovae vary on days and weeks time scales uh, supernova uh, fast radio bursts are millisecond time scales but i should point out that it is thought that some sorts of supernovae one one specific type called superluminous supernovae can be powered by these things called millisecond magnetars, which are formed after the collapse of extremely massive stars. And there is one model which suggests that these repeaters could be coming from these millisecond magnetars about 30 to 30 to 100 years after the supernova occurred. I see. So essentially, now I've heard that that the source for um, FRBs can't be a cataclysmic event like a supernova and is that again due to the the very short millisecond duration of the signals um it can be a cataclysmic event uh, for a single fast radio burst so uh, i will come back to the point about the populations but let me uh, talk about this first so it can be a cataclysmic uh, event for a single fast radio burst for example a merger of a neutron star is a cataclysmic event it will never repeat because the neutron stars get destroyed in the process so those things can form single fast radio bursts the reason why a supernova is unlikely to form a fast radio burst is that it's too big we need something that is compact but a supernova can form a neutron star which could eventually lead to a fast radio burst now my last question for you is 
seeing this this group of new um, FRBs, does that tell us anything about the previously detected FRBs, and particularly the one, the already known repeating burst? Right. So when we first detected the repeater, we had seen this very weird structure in its burst. So instead of having the single peak in its uh, radio intensity, you would get multiple peaks in time and frequency. So it would go like, bah, 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 going down to lower frequencies. Um, when when we first detected that, it wasn't clear whether this is this was a feature of repeaters as a class or whether it was something specific to that particular repeater. And when we detected the second repeater, we saw exactly the same features. And we were extremely surprised and flabbergasted because now this, this seems to be some feature of the repetition itself. But again, so the point about repeater populations, it doesn't have to be that repeaters are a completely different source class from single fast radio bursts. They could be, but you can also imagine a case where you know, young neutron stars emit a lot of bursts uh, in a very short time. They're very active. And at that point of time, we would see them as repeaters. But as they grow older, they emit uh, fast radio bursts very infrequently, maybe say once every 10 years or once every 50 years. And in that case, we would see them as single bursts. So you could imagine that they're a population, but they're connected through age or the strength of magnetic field or something of that sort. So they could simply be an effect of age. As they get older, they get quieter, it perhaps. Of age, yeah, it could be an effect of magnetic field strength. So they could be the same class of objects, but with different parameters. I see. I see. All right, Sriharsh, uh, thank you for appearing with us. And I hope you'll come back at some point and talk more about FRBs. Well, thank you for having me. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. If you'd like to support Event Horizon, you'll be pleased to know we've recently launched a Patreon. Link in the description below. Or alternatively, you can use your cellular telephone to scan the assemblage of squares on screen now. <laughs>